They were called ferry trips or delivery trips. Now, some of our aircraft in ferry command used to ferry aircraft from San Diego to Honolulu, ferry Dakotas, and their flight time was 26 hours. It just, the cabin is completely full of gas tanks. And their takeoff weights, you know, like they used to be in D Dakotas when they first got them, you know, the takeoff weights used to be maybe up around 31, 31,000 or so. But, but, uh, <coughs> but gradually they've come down. But when you let, there, there was a 12,000 foot runway at San Diego. So Dakota with a full load of fuel would take almost 12,000 feet to get airborne and they would weigh 33,500 pounds. I mean, now, now if you fly a Dakota, you fly, you're, you're all up, take out weights, you're loud, it's 26.5. And they used to fly, they were just all fuel and they were so heavy that if you'd lost an engine in the first three hours, you, you'd have been down, you'd never been able to stay up. But this was the idea that they flew them through to, to take it off of San Diego to Honolulu. They used San Diego because it had the long runway and it was headed, and the runway was headed, headed west. So you took off and just kept climbing slowly. And yeah, so we had, I had several navigators that did that. Took the aircraft through to Australia. I came in, into London and that's when I went to see my relatives and uh, when they were doing the, when they were using the V2s. I stayed in the RAF officers club in London and I went around to see my relatives. I was about three blocks, three and a half blocks from the Marble Arch when I was suddenly, I was just thrown to the ground. It was just, you know, things just went disoriented and I was on the ground on my back. So I knew that something had happened there probably because V2s were being used then and you didn't hear a V2. It just, it was coming in supersonic, so you didn't hear it. <clears throat> I got a, finally got around my Uncle Purse's there and uh, and they turned on the radio and stuff and they said, okay, the Marble Arch has been damaged and people that were five blocks away from the Marble Arch were killed. I was just lucky, I was just thrown to the ground. And maybe where I was or what it was, there was nothing, nothing that I could hit. I was just, I was just suddenly off my feet and, and, and flying onto the ground. So I guess the, 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 blast from it, the blast from it got me, but I was lucky. Because of my job, when I ferried an aircraft across the North Atlantic, then I came back to Montreal to wait to get the next aircraft out. Or there were some cases where I did, in Montreal, I did some, I did some work there, actually looking after all the works of all our many navigators. So I had a chance to, to get a couple of days off and I could take the train from Montreal to Welland and I could go home to Welland. When I got home, I would go to visit people and they would say, the women would say, what are you doing? Are you finished? I said, no, no, I'm just, I'm just home on a couple, a couple of days off. I'll, go, I'll be back over flying across the drive. How come? How, how can you do that? My son's in England. Or my son's over in France. How can you get back here? I said, well, it's a job I have. Oh, that might be a pretty nice job. I said, well, not really. You know, three weeks ago, I was in the middle of Africa. You're what? What do you mean Africa? You know Africa? Yeah. Okay, well, we've had our geography maybe, but they just couldn't, they, they, no, no, there's something wrong here. They would just say, well, we don't understand. Yes, we ferried one, one C-47. Uh, we were told we had to go by the Azores. So, uh, had bad weather, so we finally, we, we took off on a trip we had a, Ten and a half hour flight plan to fly into into uh, into southern England. So, but when we got about 300 miles away, we hit terrible headwinds. We couldn't get rid of the headwinds. We could we got so we could see the coast, but we could we could see the Scilly Isles, but we couldn't get so. We finally got close enough. We were our our, our gas tank meters were reading zero, and we were just bouncing. So we. Finally, we got into the tip there and we, and we saw a runway and we said, oh God, that must be St. Morgan. So they gave us a green light to land, so we landed, but then as the tail came down, 
a little bit of fuel left there, our engines cut out. So we were very lucky. And then when we landed, they, they said, you're, you're not at St. Morgan, you're at St. Evel. So luckily we said, well, we're out of fuel. Somebody come out and tow us. It's a long time when you're, when you're, when you're flying, you know, you fly for, for 13 hours in a C-47. We, we had a lot of things that happened to, bad things that happened to, uh, to ferry command crews. We've had the cases of, yes, of, of aircraft getting lost, getting lost flying across the Iraq and Saudi Arabia. And yes, if the crews were, if the crews were, were alive, they weren't alive very long, they treated them very badly. When I was in, in later on in 246 Squadron in, in, in England, yes, flying when there, our flights went through to, right on through to, to, uh, to India and that, yes, they, they said, yeah, flying over any of the desert countries there, like Iraq, Iraq and, and Iran wasn't as bad, but Iraq was really bad and, uh, and Saudi Arabia. I don't know why they call it a ghoulie chet, but the chet was one that, said, that was in different, different Arabic languages said that, you know, this, this person, this, if, you, if, you, if you find an airman, I mean, because usually you were wearing some kind of uniform, an airman who's crashed in your territory, if you bring him back to the nearest military establishment, we will give you 1,000, you know, whatever the currency was, yeah. You always kept track of your air position. They say, okay, if there wasn't any wind, I would be in this position. So if I can determine how much wind effect there'd be, if I've been flying for five hours, there's five hours wind effect. I can put five hours wind effect onto an air position. See, these are all plotted on a chart. You're plotting these out on the chart according to scale. So, so you say, okay, if, I, if there was no, no wind, I would be right here. So I will add a wind vector for the time included, and that should get me a, a position. So you tried everything and you took, if you could see the sea surface, you could, you could try and take wind drift and speeds off the sea and see, okay, we know what the water, what the wind has done on the sea. This is what it was probably at, at 9,000 feet. So you did everything to try to, you know, you had to be a good guesstimator and you had to know by the clouds, you had to know weather. I know weather now. See, when I see what happens in the clouds, I know what's happened to the systems. So I know where the wind should be. This is why you study so much meteorology. People say, yes, you know, meteorology. Yes, I know I'm a very good meteorologist. They did try one, one glider trip out of Goose Bay. They did try pulling them across, and they pulled them across with Hudson's. They did try to take some Bothan gliders across, which, which they did manage to do. I will always remember what I think was my most harrowing experience with Ferry Command during World War II in 1944. Three days before D-Day, we were ferrying on our usual ferry routes across the South Atlantic. We were ferrying a B-26 Marauder, which is a pretty big, heavy airplane, and we had reached West Africa. We were told by the operations officer that they were short of pilots to fly the aircraft onto Cairo. And we were quite happy, we were very happy to do the trip. We had never done it before. So, uh, so we took off on the route that I had planned, which took us over, it's over, over, over the immense Lake Chad, uh, almost dry salt lake in, in French Equatorial Africa, and on through there into the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, into Khartoum, for their final destination. And it was about an eight hour flight. Suddenly, the pilot noticed that there was an oil leak coming out of the, out of the port engine. So they had to shut down the engine and, and just fly on the one engine. Now the B-26s were known for their difficulty in, in staying airborne on one engine because they're pretty heavy with a lot of armor plate in it. So, so they were quite high to fly. So eventually it was it. The port engine, the starboard engine started to smoke. It looked like it was going to catch on fire. So we decided we had to go. So Tush said, okay, bail out. A little bit of instruction we'd had said you should, you should count to at least five when you jump out to give you a chance to clear the, to clear the tailplane so the parachute won't open the, in the tailplane. 
I jumped out of the airplane and I, I barely, I barely got up to four before I said I'm going to pull the parachute. And so I looked quickly, looked around, and there was the aircraft disappearing from me. And I looked around in the opposite direction. I was coming down pretty fast. I couldn't see much, but I looked in the opposite direction, and there, a ways away, I could see a village with a conical huts in it. So I said, "Okay." So I got ready to land on the ground. I tried to bring my knees up and crouch so I could so I could roll when I hit the ground. But I hit the ground, and uh, I was the wind gusted, and I was dragged through thorn trees and along the desert before I could hit the quick release of my parachute harness. There wasn't any sound of the birds. There wasn't any sound. There I was, in the desert, in the middle of Africa. So I started to walk through the sand over to this village. As I got closer, I went inside, and there were all, all huts, conical roofed huts made of grass or straw or something. So I didn't know what to do. I just suddenly said, please. And I pointed at the donkey, and I pointed at me, and I pointed at, I again showed the airplane flying in the sky and crashing, and pointed to where it was to try to indicate to them that I wanted to go where the airplane had crashed. Everybody sort of stood and waited. Then I think, finally they got it. Could I ride a donkey? Sure, I could ride a donkey. Anyhow, I walked over and I put my feet over the donkey and we went out through the village and out through the gate and out into the desert. We suddenly came over a hill and there ahead of me, I could see the wing of the aircraft sticking up in the air. There was the crashed airplane. Maybe Touche and Lloyd and Tommy are trapped inside that airplane that's crashed. Maybe they crashed in the ground because I didn't see any parachutes when they bailed out. I managed to get down on the ground into the sand. I was pretty thin. I only weighed 128 pounds. And I saw that the, that the cowling over the pilot's place was open. So Touche must have got out through there. So I stood on the seat and I looked. I could, I could see in the distance, I could see another village. So I got off as I was walking down the wing, looking to the village, I could see a group of figures coming out from this village. Suddenly I could see that it was Touche and Lloyd. We ran together in a flail of arms and shouts and hollers and crying. We didn't know, I thought I would never see them again. This side, this side of heaven or hell. I hadn't expected I would ever see them alive again, and here they were. The parachute I'd had was a was a Switlick built by the Switlick company. I had kept the packing slip, so I phoned the company there and told the manager. I said, "This is my story. I have been saved by a Switlick parachute. I'd like to say thank you." And he said, "Oh, fine." So he invited me to Fort Erie. So I said, get up and say, okay, I've used a sweat lick parachute just, just recently, just in the last minute in the middle of Africa, and it saved my life. And I'd like to say thank you to all you people. 